Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, an Introduction to Participatory Evaluation and Planning, Tips and Tools. I'm glad you could make it. There's been a, a large group of people who are interested in this webinar, so I'm glad that you signed up and attended. Um, I'd like to introduce you to your presenter today, Marla Steinberg. Marla has been a professional evaluator for over 25 years. She has conducted evaluations in a wide range of areas, including early childhood development, health promotion, research capacity, organizational development, leadership, partnerships and coalitions, and many more uh, areas. Her work has examined strategies, policies, and programs at the provincial, federal and community levels, and she has extensive experience in teaching and professional development that spans developing and delivering graduate level courses, in-service coaching support for health service professionals, in-person workshops, and e-learning courses, one of which is a course that we offer through Pop Data and Continuing Studies, uh, which you may have, have learned about and we'll provide more information on that. She brings to her work a passion for evaluation and a focus on engaging and experiential learning. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to you, Marla. Thank you, Anne. Um, and uh, hello to everyone. I'm so pleased that so many of you are interested in evaluation and have chosen to attend this webinar. I'm just going to turn my uh, video screen off now so that I can focus on um, what I want to say. Um, so we had about um, 90 people um, saying they were going to attend this webinar and um, I think that's amazing. So far we have about 30 or 28 people so we'll see who else shows up. Um, I'm located in Vancouver, British Columbia and about 70% um, of the original people who signed up are also lo located in BC or Vancouver um, and we're joined by a few people from across Canada and there were four people from other countries so welcome. Um, I'm extremely curious as to what drew you to this webinar so please take a minute to tell me why you are here. Uh, please, so Anne if you can run the poll, please choose the item that best represents your interests knowing that these are not mutually exclusive interests so pick the one that you think most represents um, why you've come today. Okay, so everyone should be able to see the poll in front of them and uh, we'll just actively wait while you complete the poll and then we can share the results with you. So if you look on your control panel, you'll see the, uh, the ability to complete this poll. So, so far 90% of you have voted, so we're just uh, going to wait a little bit longer, make sure everybody has time to vote. So are we ready to close it? Got 93% of people have voted. Shall we go with that? Yes, let's go with that. Okay. All right. And we're going to share it. There we go. Can everybody see the results? Marla, can you see the results? Uh, no, I can't actually. Oh, okay. All right. So basically for I plan an evaluation, I don't know where to start, 4%. I must commission and manage evaluation and want to get a maximum value, 4%. I read, an I read and assess evaluation reports as part of my work, 4%. And the big one, I'd like to gain evaluation skills for a future reference, 73%. And I'd like to add participatory techniques to my evaluation, 15%. Okay, thank you. So now that I know why most of you are here, I want to let you know why I'm doing this webinar. Um, as Anne said in my introduction, I'm very passionate 
about evaluation. I've been an evaluator for over 25 years, and I've been teaching evaluation for about 10 years. As Anne mentioned, I currently teach an online course for beginning evaluators through Pop Data BC and the University of Victoria. And if you like what you hear today and really want to develop your evaluation skills, which sounds like 73% um, of you do, then I highly encourage you to enroll in the course, um, which will run again in the fall. Um, at the end of the webinar, I will give you the URL for signing up for the course and learning more about it. Um, so now that I've gotten my shameless plug for the course out of the way, um, I can tell you why I wanted to do this webinar. I really want evaluations to be useful, used, and high quality. And I know that doing participatory evaluation will help make evaluations useful and increase the chances of them being used. I also believe that getting good hands-on evaluation training will help to produce high quality evaluations. So those are my motivations. I get to contribute to making evaluations useful and used and high quality. And as you can see here, this is what you should get out of the webinar. So I'm going to be talking for about 45 um, to 50 minutes or so, and then we'll have 10 to 15 minutes for questions and discussion. <clears throat> um, as you know, today I'm going to be sharing with you tips and tools for participatory evaluation planning. And I'm going to be using this generic evaluation planning framework um, to talk about ways of engaging people in each of these steps. Those of you familiar with evaluation will instantly recognize that these steps are present in most evaluation planning models. Here I am showing uh, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control's Guide uh, for Evaluation, which is commonly used in health evaluations. And from what I can tell about the people who signed up for this webinar, about two-thirds of you work in the health sector. All I have done um, in my generic framework is blow out step number three, which is focus the evaluation design. Why do I believe in participatory evaluation planning and its ability to improve the usefulness, use, and quality of evaluations? Well, quite simply, as you are reading, um, you need to work with program stakeholders because they are the experts in the program and the main intended users of the evaluation. And because of this, the evaluation needs to reflect their experience and their needs. They know the program. They know what decisions need to be made about the program. They know the organization, organizational and community and cultural context. And they have lived experience of the program, both as program deliverers and as um, recipients of the program. Um, now, of course, participation doesn't um, end with evaluation planning. Participatory evaluation will continue to engage in stakeholders throughout the evaluation process sometimes in data collection and always in interpreting or making sense of the data. But our focus today is on the evaluation planning steps. So if we're going to be engaging stakeholders, let's talk about what you need to think through in planning for the, their engagement. You're going to need, in order to uncover who the stakeholders are, and how they should be involved in planning the evaluation, you're going to need to do a stakeholder analysis. And this involves the four steps that you see here. I like to use this table, which comes from a publication by Hallie Preskill and Natalie Jones from 2009, um, that you see referenced at the very bottom of this slide. I find it really useful to have it with me when I begin to think about stakeholders for my evaluations because I find it covers the main groups. You should be aware, however, that this is an American publication, so some of the terms are more suited to American audiences. For example, they use the term grantees um, to talk about organizations who get funding from governments or foundations. In Canada, we tend to talk about funding recipients. Plus, this list does not explicitly name our Indigenous partners like band councils, chiefs, and elders when you're working with our First Nations communities. But as I said, I find this is usually all I need to begin the stakeholder naming process. 
When we get to the question and answer part of this webinar, you can tell me if you see other groups that are missing from this um, simple table. On this slide, I'm sharing with you a template that I use to help me think through the stakeholder analysis. And Anne will be sending you a copy of this now. Um, as you can see on the far left, I simply list my stakeholders. Once I have listed all the stakeholders, and if I can, I do this with my client or with an evaluation committee if it's already established. The next task is to think through their interest in the evaluation and how they could use the evaluation results. I then write these down in the second and third columns. And based on that, I can identify the types of involvement that they should have in the evaluation process. Once you have listed the stakeholders and determined their interests and information needs, you can use this information to fill out the fourth column to decide the most appropriate level of involvement. I use this particular tool to assign stakeholders to one of four roles or groups, um, as you can see here. This tool comes from the former Health Communications Unit at the University of Toronto, but has been reissued by Public Health Ontario, and you can get it at the link you see on the bottom of the screen. As you can see here, there are four groups or four levels of involvement, core, involved, supported, and peripheral. And I find that those four roles um, work for most of the projects that I've been engaged in. Uh, for core people, that's really the evaluation planning team. You always want to set up an advisory committee or a small planning team um, when you're doing participatory evaluation um, to help make decisions. Um, there's a number of people who will be involved, um, and they would be engaged in planning, but only for specific tasks, so consulted frequently or part of um, the evaluation planning process. There are people who will be supportive, meaning they'll provide access to resources like rooms or be the liaison um, in terms of interacting or, um, or making connections to other people. Um, or they can even be used later when the data collection process um, is underway and they might provide access to clients or other partners. And then there's a number of people who would be peripheral. People who should know about the evaluation but no, don't necessarily need to shape it. So that could be the funder or senior executives um, for some organizations. Now that you've identified your stakeholders and decided what role they will play in the evaluation, as you can see here, um, the core people will be involved in the Evaluation Advisory Committee, and they'll be involved in um, recurring either in-person or virtual meetings throughout the evaluation process. Um, we're going to spend the rest of our time really looking at how we're going to engage these core and involved people um, in these different mechanisms. You don't want your Evaluation Advisory Committee or your core group to be too big or too small. I generally find that about 10 people is as big as I want to make it. But you want to make sure that you have representation from st stakeholders with the greatest lived experience of the program, and that's either as program staff um, or program participants, or both ideally. But you also want representation from the main decision makers. If it's a program with a large group of stakeholders um, or a large number of people from each of the groups, you can always involve them in specific tasks, so they play more of an involved role than a core role rather than being members of the Evaluation Advisory Committee. And when setting up your advisory committee, be sure to create a terms of reference so the stakeholders know what they are committing themselves to in terms of time and decision-making um, role, and the decision-making role this committee will play. On one of my last slides, I will give you some guidance as to the time commitment you'll need from people, at least for the evaluation planning stages. As we saw in the CDC evaluation framework a couple of slides back, the first task you do with your stakeholders is to describe the program. I find the best way to do this is to engage them in developing a logic model, or if one already exists, reviewing it. For those of you less familiar with evaluation and logic models, they are sim a simple visual way to convey information about your program. They really, at their core, are a series of if-then relationships that show what will happen if the program is implemented as intended and the desired outcomes. This is probably one of the most common forms that logic models take, 
Although when you Google logic models on the internet, you will find all sorts of different shapes and sizes, including ones that run vertically. I tend to use this one and its associated templates during the initial brainstorming stages of just getting ideas down on paper. And then I can create a more visually appealing one that's better linked to the program, the organization, or any branding that they've established. If you check out the link at the bottom of this um, slide, you will find this and other blank templates that you can download for both Word and Excel. And you can use those for working with your groups. Why is stakeholder engagement important in developing logic models? Well, there are a number of reasons. The first is that the program may actually run differently than what's described in program documents. So involving stakeholders in talking about their activities will provide an accurate picture of what the program does, or perhaps even surface different understandings of the program that can then be explored in the evaluation. Involving stakeholders also allows you to surface salient outcomes, outcomes that may not be evident to an outsider, or something that's in the organization's strategic plan, or important to senior management, or patients, clients, or partners. Uh, the third reason is that it allows you um, to surface key language and framing. When you listen to people talking about their program, you get to hear how they actually talk about it. For, no, for most normal people, or non-evaluators, they don't speak in outcome and impact language. But when you listen to them, they will tell you stories. And as a skilled evaluator, you will hear outcomes loud and clear. And you can bring them to the conversation for verification. I was once working with a group to revise their logic model. It was a program addressing food security. In listening to them talk about their program, I could hear that they wanted to have impacts on system-wide outcomes that went beyond just improving access to food and improving people's knowledge and skills about where to find food and how to prepare it. But when we looked at their logic model, that was nowhere in sight. So actually just listening to them helped me um, verify and put back into their logic model some outcomes that were really important to them. The fourth reason you want to engage stakeholders in developing logic, model, logic models is, it, it, is because it creates ownership. It's a, it allows each person or each partner to see their role in the desired outcomes and understand how they are making a difference. Several years ago, I was working with an organization and we got everyone in the organization involved in creating logic models for their departments and programs. And I really do mean everyone. Um, the receptionist came up to me afterwards and she said she really appreciated the session as it was the first time she saw how her job, um, answering phones and greeting people um, at the reception desk, was connected to the organization achieving its mission. And that's why participatory evaluation planning is so great. We don't have to wait for the evaluation findings to have an impact on the program. Uh, one of the best ways of doing um, logic modeling, participatory logic modeling, is an in-person meeting. And here are some ideas of how you can do it uh, through an in-person meeting. You have to get all your, facil your facilitator's gear on. So you bring your flip charts, your whiteboards, or your post-its. Um, and then you can provide definitions and examples of each component of the logic model, so activities, initial, subsequent, and ultimate, ultimate outcomes, and then allow each person to generate content or do it as a group. And here are the examples I use in my logic model development sessions or workshops. And again, you can see that these come from the University of Wisconsin Extension Program, which is um, the same site and the same source that I uh, got the logic model templates. I simply um, blow these up on, um, on pieces of paper and stick them to the whiteboard or the flip chart so people can refer to them as they generate their inputs, activities, outputs, and reach. This is a tool I use to help people think through outcomes. As you can see here, and again, this one comes from the University of Wisconsin. So as you can see here, this, um, this outcome grid talks about, or divides outcomes into short, intermediate, and long-term outcomes, which usually implies some sort of timeline, although the timeline is usually undefined. I tend to use the terms initial, subsequent, and ultimate outcomes because it conveys the sequencing of them which is part of the logic of a logic model and does not require that we identify what are usually hard to de determine timelines. What I like about this tool is that it precisely shows the chain of outcomes that begin with learning, 
moves to actions, and ultimately to changes in conditions, in conditions like health and well-being. And as I said, I simply stick this up and provide a bit of explanation, and then send people off generating content for the logic model. If you don't have the budget to bring people together, you can always do participatory logic modeling over the phone or internet. The idea here is that you schedule a teleconference and use a screen sharing platform like the one you see here, which is Zoom. Um, they have a freemium business model, which means you can use a somewhat restricted version of the platform for free. Um, I have put up the URL for the site. Um, with the free version, you can have unlimited attendees, but your meetings can only last 45 minutes. But you can, all, you can always schedule back-to-back -back meetings with a little break in between to get the full time that you need. The nice thing about this platform over Skype, which most people are familiar with, is that your attendees don't need to have a Zoom account, and you don't need to have everybody's Skype password. There are other screen sharing platforms that work as well, um, and they're usually easy to find. So the idea here is that you use a screen sharing over the phone or the internet, and you can either use um, a whiteboard or a blank document and ask for input into the logic model just as you would in an in-person meeting. Even if the program already has a logic model, it's a good idea to review it through the same process and make sure that it is resonant with your stakeholders. As you may discover, some of them may never have seen the logic model or been involved in its creation. If you find it difficult to get everyone together at a specific time, you can also use asynchronous engagement where you provide the task and each person provides their input um, when it's convenient for them. Just don't forget to tell them the timeline for giving their input. Here you can either get input through a survey or a document that everyone can edit or add to, as you see here. I simply created an Excel spreadsheet on Google Drive with each column representing one component of the logic model. What's nice about an editable document, I don't even know if that's a word, but uh, you know what I mean, is that everyone can see everyone else's contribution and leave comments as well. Whereas with a survey, although you can display or some survey platforms allow you to display results as they are entered, it's more or less each person giving their input on their own, which may be okay if you think that it will help the process. The survey also lets you see how much commonality there is, whereas the editable document won't tell you that. Whether you have developed the logic model through an in-person meeting or virtually, you take the input that you get and integrate it into a meaningful and coherent logic model. Then you give it back to people to review and refine. Once the logic model is developed, the next step would be to engage your stakeholders in selecting the evaluation questions. If you are doing this in the same session as the logic model, you need to build in a little bit of time to review the logic model input and produce a synthesized version um, for the question generation work. Even if you don't have time to do this, you can still use the same meeting to list all the questions of interest to the stakeholders. As I mentioned at the end of the webinar, I will give you some ideas of how you can bundle these different tasks over um, a number of separate meetings. In developing evaluation questions, you really have to be selective and strategic in deciding what to evaluate in any given evaluation. It's rarely possible um, to evaluate everything, um, largely because we're always working with restricted budgets. So you need to identify evaluation questions, then prioritize and select those that are most relevant, realistic, and useful for guiding decision making and other stakeholder needs. One really nice way to generate evaluations questions is to pose this simple question. What do you want to know and show? And this comes from demonstrating value from Van City, and I use it all the time and find it a really simple way of getting stakeholders to think about what they want to know through their evaluations. As you can see here, this can be done in an in-person meeting or virtually. Once you have generated the list of potential evaluation questions, you can get the stakeholders to select the questions the evaluation will address. You can do this in the same meeting or the next engagement. Here you simply review all the questions generated, remove duplicates, but keep note of them, um, group them into meaningful categories, 
and get stakeholders to vote or rank order the questions of most importance. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, to assist in developing evaluation questions, you can do what I have described, simply get stakeholders to think through what they want to know and show. But evaluation questions can also be generated through three other sources. The logic model, third party accountability frameworks, or a theoretical framework like a KT framework or an empowerment framework, if that's what you're using in your evaluation. So let's look at these as well. On this slide, you see the generic evaluation questions that are asked across um, a number of different types of evaluations, process evaluations, outcome evaluations, impact evaluations, and on the far left, um, needs assessments. Up till now, I've not talked about the different types of evaluation or even including included it as a step in the planning process. I do this for a couple of reasons. First, as those of you familiar with the evaluation literature will know, people use these terms in different ways, particularly the terms formative and summative and impact and outcome. So I find it easier just to get people to, to think about what information they want, what is it they want to know and show. And these terms are really evaluation speak, and as I said, I just find it easier uh, to communicate with regular people if you ask them to talk about what they want to know and show. So another way of supporting them to, make, to generate evaluation questions is to give them a list of common questions like these ones and get them to rank order them um, of most importance to them. The logic model itself is also a source of evaluation questions. This slide shows the logic model of a parenting program. Here you can see that the questions fall out of it, each component of the logic model. The inputs, activities, reach, and outcomes. So once you have developed your logic model, you can then use it as a tool to develop the evaluation questions. The last thing I wanted to point out is evaluation questions that are based on third-party accountability frameworks, um, like Treasury Board Secretariat. So there are times when there are mandatory evaluation questions that come with program funding or other third-party evaluation frameworks. Um, for example, all programs funded by the federal government have to address relevance and performance, although I believe the new directive on evaluation has more flexibility in it. But if the funder is requiring certain evaluation questions, it's best to include those in the list and then ask stakeholders if there's anything else that they're interested in. Another common framework that's widely used in healthcare is the triple or quadruple aim. As you can see, it has built-in evaluation questions that focus on patient experience, patient outcomes, and patient costs. Again, if you're required to use this, because this is the framework that the organization wants to use, you can begin with these three questions and get stakeholders to add other questions of interest. <clears throat> So there is a number of things that you can ask people to think about when they prioritize their evaluation questions, and you can read them here. Um, I hope you can see that you can easily turn these into criteria that stakeholders can use to assess each evaluation question and ultimately to prioritize their evaluation questions. And this can be done either in person or virtually. You simply get each person to rate the evaluation question on a number of these criteria. Now that you have involved your stakeholders in developing the logic model and identifying and selecting evaluation questions, you can engage them in selecting the indicators, the fourth step in our generic evaluation planning process. Indicators tell you what you will measure to answer your evaluation questions. Indicators are the specific, observable, and measurable constructs that you're actually measuring. There can be and should be more than one indicator for each evaluation question, and you can include targets or benchmarks. For example, 80% of patients will report being actively involved in treatment decisions, if that's what your program is focusing on. This is one of my favorite illustrations of indicators. It was put together by my friend and extremely talented evaluator, Kylie Hutchinson. Here you can see outcomes and their indicators. The indicators are telling you how you're going to assess the outcome 
or the, or the information that you will use to answer your evaluation question. So for Cinderella, we might assume that the outcome of uh, Cinderella, if it were a program, would be to live happily ever after, and the indicators that we would use to determine whether or not happily ever after is happening is the number of new shoes in the closet and Cinderella's self-reports of increased happiness. So you can see just within there that depending on who you invite to generate indicators, who your stakeholders are, they might have different views of what happiness is. Um, for this particular group of stakeholders, new shoes in the closet was happiness. There might be other stakeholders who would have under other indicators of happiness. I also really like this slide, which comes from the University of Wisconsin again. And although I can see the link on uh, my slide, it's not um, showing on yours, but it's the same source um, as the two other slides. Here again, we see the logic model for a parenting program with the evaluation questions and their indicators. And what I really like about this is it explicitly shows the link between the logic models, evaluation questions, and indicators. And this is our parenting program logic model um, again. When you're developing indicators, they need to be linked to your evaluation questions, but they also should be smart or smarter. And some of you, and probably most of you, are familiar with the SMART acronym. Um, what I like is the smarter one because it adds in two other dimensions, um, ethical and relevant. Um, I was teaching a evaluation workshop a couple of weeks ago and um, when I began the workshop I asked people what they wanted to get out of it and one of the um, responses I got which really resonated with me was somebody wanted a way of picking indicators that are relevant to people that they're working with. Um, instead of having to respond to indicators that sometimes come from senior management that don't really have any meaning for people. So it's really important that you're working with your stakeholders to identify relevant um, indicators. I've also included, uh, which is why I like the SMARTER acronym, I've also included a link to an indicator checklist that you can use to help you and your stakeholders assess the value of the indicators that you have developed. When you do participatory indicator selection, as you can see here, you can either brainstorm indicators for each evaluation question with your stakeholders, or um, before you do that, you can search the internet for common indicators. In recent years, we've really seen an explosion of indicator lists and frameworks in almost every domain or program area. And these are great starting places for thinking about indicators. But be aware that you should select your indicators only after you have determined what it is you want to indicate. With so many indicator frameworks out there, um, I have seen far too many evaluations start with indicator selection. That's the first thing they do. They bring people together and they just say what our indicators should do. And then um, they get themselves overwhelmed and bog bogged down because there's too many indicators out there. Um, and they end up picking a bunch of indicators and have no clear picture of what they actually want to be indicating. So my advice is don't go indicator shopping until you know what you're shopping before, what you're shopping for, or else you will end up with something that looks nice but doesn't really meet your needs and won't be useful to you at all. Um, and as you can see, you can do the same process um, in an in-person meeting or, um, or virtually. On this slide for your reference, um, here's some links to some common indicators just so you can see the range of areas um, that, um, that they exist for. And in the course that I teach um, through Pop Data and UVic, one of the activities that we do is search the internet for indicator frameworks for the student evaluation projects. And I'm always amazed that most students are able to find indicator frameworks for their programs. But in the course, they're not just starting with looking for indicators. They know what it is they want to indicate. Now that you've developed your logic model, selected your evaluation questions, and selected your indicators, you will need to decide how you will collect your data. You have to pick your data collection design and methods. 
And the way you choose to collect your data or your data collection design will influence how easily you can say that your program contributes to desired outcomes. For most of you, um, or for a large number of you, of the people who originally signed up, I think we had about 50% um, of people who were um, affiliated with um, research organizations. Uh, this should be a review for you. There's basically three main types of research designs that will help you detect changes. There are experimental designs, quasi-experimental designs, and non-experimental designs. And this is really where research and evaluation come together. They both use the same types of methodologies to collect data. At the bottom of the slide, I've included a link to a very helpful resource on different ways you can show contribution without using experimental designs. I encourage you to check that out when you have time. Before I talk about ways to engage stakeholders in deciding on the data collection design, um, I want to talk about the data collection methods. Um, and then I'll talk about how you can engage stakeholders in both at the same time. So how do you choose which design to use? Well, really, you should be basing your design on what will most match the purpose of the evaluation, so the information that people want, the resources available, and the timeline to optimize use. Um, for those of you who are familiar with research designs, you know that each has its strengths, weaknesses, and feasibility considerations. First one is, can you actually randomly assign people? Or can you actually, if you're doing a quasi-experimental design, can you collect pre-intervention data? These are some of the things that you need to think through in order to decide what is the best design for your context. Um, as I said, I'm going to just briefly talk about data collection methods before I talk about how to do participatory selection of design and methods. What you see here are common ways of collecting data. And again, most of you should be pretty familiar with these. I've grouped them into two groups, primary data collection, um, which includes all the techniques that we use to um, get new data for people and secondary data collection, which involves using existing data um, to get the information that we want. And for those of you with social science research backgrounds, this should be pretty familiar to you. <clears throat> In any evaluation, it's best to have multiple methods. That way you can triangulate your data and give you the best view into what's happening in the program. Uh, one of my current students in the uh, evaluation course that I'm teaching is developing an evaluation plan for a school-based program to improve teacher instruction. Um, she recognized that it will, be, it will be important to collect data from teachers, school administrators, and students. And that way she can triangulate the information she gets from all the resources to understand what difference this program is really making. In terms of how you engage people in participatory design and method selection, as you can see here, um, engaging the stakeholders in deciding on the design and methods involves the same process whether you are engaging people in person or virtually. It's about presenting information on the strengths, challenges, and feasibility of the different design options and getting input into which designs and methods would best suit your context. You can engage people through surveys or interviews or focus groups. Basically, you'll end up collecting pretty similar information. And one isn't better than the other. What makes you choose one over the other is what your stakeholders have to tell you about which would be most acceptable um, to the people that you're working with. If you're working with people who um, prefer oral ways of communicating, then doing interviews or focus groups might work. If people are comfortable with surveys and the type of information you want to collect is amenable to a survey, then that's what you will use. So the only way to really pick, in addition to your budget, is to work with your stakeholders to understand what's the best way um, of getting engagement from the people that you want to be collecting data from. And here we are at the last step in our participatory evaluation planning process, selecting the data collection tools. The data collection tool is the instrument used to gather your indicators to answer the evaluation questions. 
they're basically two types, standardized tools that have established validity and reliability and non-standardized ones or the ones that you make up or adapt from other tools. Regardless of which you use, um, both should be pilot tested to work out the bugs. When doing participatory data collection, or di participatory data collection tool development, as you can see here, the process is the same whether you are doing in-person engagement or working with people virtually. I recommend um, searching the internet and academic literature for tools or tool repositories. Select a few that you think um, would give you the indicators that will answer your evaluation questions and ask stakeholders to review them. If you can't find any tools or they don't or they don't have questions that address all your indicators, you will use your skills in question design to write questions for indicators um, when you need to do that. And then you'd ask stakeholders to review them as well. I definitely recommend um, bringing established tools and draft, and draft questions to the committee to review and revise. Um, I wouldn't suggest developing data collection tools in a group meeting, although you can, depending on the engagement of your stakeholders, because I find a lot of that work is wordsmithing, and that's not usually a very efficient way um, to use people's time. Plus, in this phase of evaluation planning, you really need to be relying on your technical skills here, much more so than in other areas. Um, so I find it best to um, bring draft tools to the stakeholders and they have a chance to revise them and review them and put them in a language that's going to work for people that they're going to be working with. But I can see, depending on some stakeholders and how much time we have, that it would be possible to generate questions um, as a group. Now that you've completed all the steps in developing your evaluation plan through engaging your stakeholders, here's one more tool that I'd like to share with you. It's a simple way to record your evaluation plan, and Anne can send you a copy of that now. Just so this shows... I can just interrupt a little bit. Just I sent it through the chat function as well that, um, that the handouts are in the handout section on your control panel, so you should find them there. And if you don't have them, uh, let me know. Thanks. Thanks, Marla. Okay, and I, I forgot to mention that we will be sending a copy of these slides around after the webinar as well. Um, and if people didn't get a chance to, um, to get the tools that we're sending around, we can send them around there as well. Um, so what I like about this very simple evaluation plan is that it really shows the logic or the links between evaluation questions, indicators, data sources, um, data collection methods, and timing, or when you're going to collect your data. What it doesn't explicitly show here is the data collection design, um, but you can always have a paragraph that talks about that. Um, you'll also note that there are a few other things you need, to, you need to work out in the evaluation planning stage, including the reporting plan and the budget. You should definitely be engaging your stakeholders in developing the reporting plan. Um, these are the people who know who needs to see the evaluation report and the types of reports that would work best for them. Um, typically, as an evaluator, you would work out the budget based on the evaluation plan that you collaboratively developed. Um, ideally, it's good to know the budget up front before you start the evaluation planning process, because it also influences the choices that you make. For example, um, interviews tend to be more costly than doing surveys. But in the absence of a budget, you can still make decisions based on what's going to be best for stakeholders. And if you've engaged your stakeholders in the planning process along the way, you will then have ways to pare down the plan if it exceeds the resources that are available. As I mentioned, um, it's possible to do a number of the tasks in the evaluation planning process at one time. Here you see a schedule that enables you to get everything done in a series of four meetings. And this sort of schedule also allows you to do in-between work, the in-between work to help your stakeholders make informed decisions. So you can also see I've put down what the meeting prep would be in advance of each of those meetings. So you can actually do full planning in one day, um, and I have done that. 
Um, it will be a long day and you need, you need to build in time for synthesis and revision. What I generally like if there's not enough time to space it among four days or four meetings is to consider two meetings, one full day to develop the plan and a second day to review the plan. Um, this schedule and working out the schedule also allows you to communicate to your stakeholders the time commitment that you need from them. When you are considering whether to use in-person or virtual engagement, there are a few things you need to consider. Um, first of all, it's the budget. Do you have the money and the resources um, to bring people together? Or are people willing to use in-kind contributions and pay for their own uh, travel? Um, that would work for people who are working with, um, with organizations, but when you're bringing um, program recipients together, you need to pay for um, for them to attend. Um, what's the timeline for evaluation planning? Do you have time to space it over a series of four meetings that really it can be done within a week um, or you can take a more um, leisurely timeline and do it over two weeks? Um, you need to think about the literacy and language of people you're working with. Um, if you do a survey or you do virtual meetings, are people going to be able to participate um, if you don't have a translator or if there's a lot of reading that has to happen? You also have to think about the culture of the people that you're working with. Is it more appropriate to do things face-to-face -to, -face to build the relationships or is it a group that's used to working over the internet and responding virtually and doesn't need the face-to-face -face time? You also have to think about the availability of stakeholders. Can you actually get everybody together for a full day or a series of four two-hour meetings um, where most people can attend? Or is it easier just to do asynchronous meetings where people can participate um, on their own time? And the other thing you need to think about is connectivity, right? Does, if you're going to be using uh, virtual meetings, does everybody have access to reliable internet connection? Um, another way of bundling things is to do um, the logic model and developing evaluation questions in person and then use develop indicators, methods and tools um, virtually and also um, review the full evaluation plan virtually. So to wrap up, um, I hope by now I have convinced everyone of the value of participatory evaluation planning. For those of you who have to plan an evaluation, I hope I've given you some easy to use tools that you can use to do participatory evaluation planning. For those of you who have to manage evaluations, I hope you're walking away with ideas of how you want your evaluation planning to unfold. And for those of you who are mainly evaluation consumers and your main engagement with evaluation is as a reader of evaluation reports and doesn't that reader look like she's going to enjoy reading the report, drinking her lovely cup of tea and sitting in a comfortable place? Um, I hope I've given you some ideas on how to judge the quality and usefulness or applicability of evaluations. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, I want evaluations to be high quality and done well. On this last slide, I want to again shamelessly promote the evaluation course that I teach through Population Data BC and the Ver University of Victoria. And as I said, there's a URL for the registration and getting more information about the course. But I also want to share with you other ways that you can continue to build your evaluation skills. Um, one of the easiest ways of doing it, if you actually have an evaluation project, is to find a mentor. And the Canadian Evaluation Society has set up a mentoring program where you can register um, that you're looking for an experienced evaluator to help you mentor, to help mentor you through your first evaluation project. If you're in BC, and uh, according to the registration, there were a number of people in BC, you can join a community of practice for new and emerging evaluators. That's run through the BC Yukon chapter of the Canadian Evaluation Society. And I've put up um, the contact information for uh, one of the facilitators for uh, that community of practice, Carolyn Kamen. And uh, the last suggestion I have is you can, um, if you really want to get into, it, into evaluation and do more than take one course, you can enroll in an evaluation certificate or a diploma program 
And the URL or the link that I have put up here is the one that's offered through University of Victoria. But if you're in other places of Canada, they're offered um, by other universities uh, as well, including virtually. So that brings us to the end. And we are now ready to open it up for questions and comments. And I'd also like to invite you um, to try out these ideas and let me know how they work for you, or tell me about other fun and creative ways that you have engaged stakeholders in evaluation planning. As you've seen from um, this webinar, I like to use examples that people have actually done. So when people tell me stories of what they've done, and if you're willing for me to share your story, I'm happy to promote it in my courses um, and in webinars that I do. So Anne, is it over to you to field questions in the chat section? Yeah. Thank you very much, Marla, for an excellent presentation. I think there's lots of resources and materials for people to follow up on. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I do have the first question here. Um, and when you ask a question through the chat function, um, when I respond to it, everybody will be also be able to read the question as well as hear the question that I will present orally. If you do happen to have uh, a microphone on your computer, you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you so you can ask the question orally yourself. So first question, um, thank you for the presentation and could you please outline what the difference between participatory and non-participatory evaluations would be? Um, okay, so in a non-participatory evaluation as the evaluator, you would basically sit in your office and um, decide what the evaluation is going to focus on, um, how you're going to collect your data, what your indicators are, and come up with it all on your own, either just by looking at program documents or often responding to an RFP. In participatory evaluation, you're engaging the stakeholders in every aspect of developing the evaluation plan, so deciding what questions will be addressed in the evaluation, how the questions will be operationalized or the indicators, and how data will be collected. Okay, thank you. Um, and please let us know if, if any of these questions need further, further details. So next question, um, how do you decide if participatory approach is the right one compared to the conventional approach? And are there ways to assess stakeholder readiness? Um, yeah, so um, <clears throat> I generally find, and literature bears this out, that um, if you want your evaluations to be useful and used, you have to engage your stakeholders in figuring out what it is they want to evaluate um, and what's the best way of going about doing the evaluation. Um, so when you're working with when you're meeting your client for the first time or talking to programs about how they want to proceed, um, you can tell them about the value of participatory evaluation and how the evaluation will be done collaboratively with um, input and decision making by the stakeholders and see if they're um, willing to engage in that. Um, there's, I don't know of any tools um, that actually assess readiness, although there are a number of tools that assess readiness for evaluation. So you might want to have a look at that and see um, if there are questions that ask about people's willingness to be engaged. Um, if you don't engage them, you risk doing an evaluation that really misses the mark, right? Doesn't answer questions that people um, want answers to, doesn't provide information in a way that's going to be credible to them, and doesn't collect data in a way that's going to get the most um, reliable and useful information. Uh, you're basically taking your best guess if you're not engaging people about what they want. And oftentimes, even if you're responding to an RFP, I find um, unless the RFP has been written by an evaluator, which typically it isn't, um, there's a lot of information that's missing from the RFP that needs to be talked about in order to make decisions about how best to move forward. So these are conversations that you have um, with your clients or program staff about um, how the evaluation is going to unfold and a way of making sure that 
the evaluation is useful and used because um, that's really what you want to be striving for. So Michael Quinn Patton talks about utilization focused evaluation and the only way to really get utilization focused evaluation is to engage your stakeholders in determining what is what is going to be evaluated and how. Okay, thank you. Um, we have sort of a related question, uh, and maybe it speaks a bit more about the the readiness of engaging, uh, uh, the readiness of stakeholders to be engaged. But the question is, could you mention some strategies to engage reluctant straight stakeholders? And I don't know if that's a possibility, but uh, there's the question. Um, <clears throat> so, again, I guess it depends who they are. So if you have um, sort of the main decision makers um, talking about or recognizing the value of doing participatory evaluation uh, planning. Um, then you set up processes and meetings so that people see the value of their engagement and that make th or help them recognize that they really are the experts in the program either because they are delivering the program or they are the recipients of it. So it's about, I guess, having um, respectful relationships and um, giving people the opportunity to, to actually experience that um, they have information that needs to be um, brought to planning the evaluation, their perspectives are helping shape the evaluation, and that um, they can contribute to making meaning and making it useful. Um, if And I have had experiences where I propose participatory um, approaches and the client or the program just isn't interested. They, as the main um, decision maker, want to make all the decisions um, for the evaluation. And um, I generally find that um, if you don't engage people who need to be providing you with information or um, the recipients of the program in deciding what methods to use, you may be approaching them with methods that just don't make sense to them. And again, I go to that comment of um, the workshop that I had given a couple of weeks ago, and one of the main objectives um, that the woman mentioned was wanting to have indicators that are relevant to them. So when you just engage kind of senior management or a few people in developing the evaluation, you risk collecting information that's not useful to everyone. Maybe those indicators were relevant to senior management, but the frontline staff didn't really see the value of them. Um, and it wasn't collecting information that they wanted to have to be able to improve their programming. So um, I think it really is about selling um, the value of engaging people with specific examples and talking about what the process is going to look, right, look like, right? So sometimes people don't know um, what to expect. So if you use um, like the bundling chart or those four meetings, you could say to people, you could say to your clients, um, over the course of four meetings, you know, eight hours, we will, we will engage people in developing the evaluation um, so that they have buy-in, right? That's another huge thing. If you, um, anytime you engage people in developing something they're going to use, the chances of it being used are greater. Um, so it'll increase the validity and the use of the evaluation and the engagement in the evaluation. And here's four meetings that we're going to have and this is what we're going to do. Um, because to not do that, you really run the risk of kind of wasting everyone's time. So maybe you get an evaluation. I mean, if you, if you use data collection tools that aren't resonant with people who need to fill it out, they're not going to fill it out, right? They're going to look at, they might look at the survey link, look at a couple of questions and just not answer them. So you really risk kind of wasting time and resources unless you're doing something that um, really reflects the culture and the context of the people that you're working with. Thank you, Marla. And we're just uh, we're getting close to the end here, just about 11 o'clock now, but there's one more question. Um, uh, with participatory evaluation approach, is it best to begin evaluation planning prior to the implementation? Um, yeah, so um, it's always best to begin evaluation planning um, 
when you're developing your program. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, one is because having an evaluative lens is a really good way of shaping programs to make sure that they know um, what they're trying to achieve and the activities that they're doing, the program components, um, have a solid base into potentially leading to those outcomes. So the best way of planning a program um, is to involve an evaluator. In, in public health, um, the competencies for public health practitioners include both planning and evaluation. So sometimes you will be planning a program um, and um, also developing the evaluation at the same time. The other reason it's important to plan your evaluation before you implement is because you need to know what data you want to collect. So for example, if you're going to do um, a pre test, post-test design, um, you obviously need to get some pre-data from, uh, from the program participants and you have to do that before you start implementing. So absolutely, the best time to plan, a pro uh, to plan an evaluation is when you're planning the program. And it's really um, frustrating, I guess, or um, challenging when um, programs phone you up after they've been running for a couple of years and say that we need to now produce an evaluation report, but we haven't done anything to collect data. So you're not necessarily going to be able to get retrospective data from people who have already gone through the program. And it's even more challenging when they say the evaluation report is due in three months. Um, so the best time to plan the evaluation is when you're planning the program or just about to um, begin the program. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's all of our questions. Um, if there are further questions that you think of after this webinar, feel free to send them to me. I can uh, su summarize them, collect them, and send them uh, to Marla for feedback, and then we can loop that back into, into the group. So thank you again for everyone for attending. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Marla, for presenting. Uh, lots of useful information. We will send out a copy of the, uh, the PowerPoint that's been presented. Uh, the session will be recorded. Um, we'll send the handouts as well in case you've missed them. And, and also there is, of course, an evaluation. <laughs> and we would really appreciate it if you'd uh, fill out the feedback form that I send you in the email so we know how we did and what you'd like to see more of. And again, if you're looking for uh, more opportunities to learn more about evaluation, uh, please do refer to that slide that Marla provided about different ways to get engaged, and we'd be happy to hear more from you. So thanks again, and uh, talk to you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.